give a huge round of applause to John Carmack. Good luck. Thank you. All right, it is really great to be here this year. It's been so many years where we talk about what we're working on, what we're doing, what we're thinking about, and actually have it now where you can go over and play Rage, what we've spent six years working on. And if, uh, if you've seen me, I've been spending a lot of time over there just watching people play generally with a big old grin on my face where we had so much that we set out to do on this that was different than what we had done before. I mean, it had been almost a, a stereotype of what you do, first-person shooter, run-and-gun corridors, monsters jumping out at you, this type of thing that we invented this genre and we followed it for a long ways, but people thought that was what, you know, that was all that we were doing. And with Rage, we set out to be really pretty ambitious, to do a lot of things that we had never done before. And in hindsight, knowing that it took six years, we would look back and say, maybe we shouldn't have been quite as ambitious. Maybe we should have you know, done a few more of the things that we already had plenty of experience doing. But in the end, everybody gets the benefit of, you know, we picked hard battles, we fought through all of them, and in the end, I think we did a really damn good job on it. Where the things that we set out to do, yeah, thanks. <laughs> And it's kind of a tough situation here where we've got thousands of people here and we've got a couple dozen stations that people can play on over there. On the one hand, I would like everybody to get a taste of the game, to sit down and just jump in and see how it feels, kind of experience the, the high frame rate and the smooth interactions and all this stuff. But I also want to see the game is so much more than the sum of its parts, where every level is fun. You can jump on, I think they've got the dev menus there, you can pick any level, jump into it, and kind of blast your way through it and have a good time. But you really don't get the sense of what the game's about unless you sit down and really spend hours with it. And it was great this last press set of things that we did a couple weeks ago, where we had them sit down for three hours, and you start the game, you play for three hours, and you're really only breaking into sort of the meat of the game by that point. You've been introduced to the things that are there, the stuff that you can do, and you're finally opening up. That's the point where the world opens up to you, and you can see all of these other things that you can do. And it was, you know, it's great to find these places where you've got people where like, okay, time to go, you need to be leaving, like, one minute, one minute, you know, staying on the game. So uh, I'm hoping that a few people will basically camp some of the stations over there and you know, run your way through the whole game, tag team through it, and see all the awesome stuff in there. Where like the new trailer uh, shows a bunch of things that you really only get to on the second DVD, sort of the second half of the game, and there's so much there. Um, it's, it really is probably the most enjoyable id game from my perspective that we've ever made. Uh, you know, I've played all of our games to degrees, but I was never one of the people that could spend eight hours like deathmatching. You know, I know there's a lot of you out there, but that was never uh, kind of like my take on our games. But the pacing on Rage allows us to go ahead and have a game where you have moments of abject terror and intensity, and it's, it's nicely balanced by the areas where you're going through, you're exploring, or you're talking in town, doing these things. And we learned a lot through this process. And by no means are we ready to be stood up next to Skyrim or something as an adventure game. And that's not what we're doing. But there are, it is clear at this point that there are beneficial things that we can add to the gameplay experience where we take everything that was fun and good about classic id games, and you can do these other things that, that add additional layers to it, that don't take anything away. There are a lot of design choices where you have to make fundamental decisions. Are you this type of game or are you this type of game? If you do this, you're going to annoy some of these other people. Uh, but there are also some things that are just pure wins where you can add this on, people can ignore it, or they can, they can go ahead and dive into it and get a lot more out of it. Uh, you know, there are, there are lots of aspects to the game that I, I, have, to, I have to caution myself when I do this because I'm tempted to go all post-mortem on the game at this point and say, look over, as an engineer, I'm like, oh, this could have been better. We should have done this this way. We can make this so much better. You know, we can improve this in the future. But in the end, we hit everything we really set out to do with the, with the game. It took a lot longer than we expected, but everything that we kind of envisioned pretty much made it into the game. And from my point of view, the game has so many things in it that I certainly didn't imagine when we started off or even early, you know, even 
three years ago. And that's been, that's always the most rewarding part as a technical director for me is I have a, an idea of what the platform that we're creating will let people do. But when the artists and the designers get in and they build some of these just magnificent things, I, you know, it's in many ways as much of a shock to me as it is to everybody else playing the game. You know, I don't have, you know, I don't have that resolution of imagination that the artists can do where they can build these worlds that are just so fabulous. And the game, you know, when I'm playing the game, you can be into the game, having such a, a great time running through it, blasting at things, but practically anywhere you can stop, look around, and just soak in that the world, it's like, it's a, one of the, uh, the press people called it a moving painting. And I really like that, where you can, you can stop and see and how the artists and the stampers, practically every area, it's not just the showpiece room that you make the screenshot for for the back of the box, but we have terabytes of data that are just gone through, plastered with all this tender, loving care throughout the game. And there's some really fabulously beautiful areas in it that are, you know, that are really rewarding to look at. And it doesn't, the core technical decision that's gone into all of this, and I always hesitate to, to make too much of this because people like to latch on to it, but the, the mega texture technology is the signature thing that, that people latch on to as the differentiation. But it's important to realize that that is, you know, it's maybe 10% of the code, which is maybe 25% of the effort that goes into the game. So it's this tiny, tiny part. But it is the thing that makes the game stand out, where it gives it its super high performance on the console generation of hardware, and it gives it the kind of painterly look at things. But it's, uh, I will spend some time going over some of the details and the trade-offs on there, because we had to make conscious choices on that. It got us what we wanted in the end. It got us this moving painting at 60 frames per second with this evocative art style through everything. But we did have to make some significant sacrifices and overcome a lot of challenges to actually make that happen. Uh, sometimes I look at it and say, it's clearly the most sophisticated part of the code. Again, there's millions of lines of code in the software code base now. And you know, only tens of thousands of them are sort of directly related to this, but it is dismayingly complicated in many ways, all the things that we had to go through to make this vision of this painted world happen. Uh, when you, you know, after this, you'll all be mega texture experts and you can point out the flaws and details of, uh, of this when you're looking at the games. Uh, but there's performance characteristics that impact the game. Uh, the versions that are playing over there are either PC or 360 installed to the hard drive. Uh, so this is sort of the, the good case performance for streaming in all of the data. Uh, there's a spectrum of behavior that you can expect where the worst behavior that you'll get is if you take a DVD on a 360 without any hard drive, which means that every texture that you pull in has to come in off of the DVD. Uh, we do a bunch of smart stuff to go ahead and know where all the textures are, schedule all the reads, batch them up, try and read linearly. But the bottom line is still that you want a new piece of texture data on there and it can take uh, you know, 150 milliseconds in a bad case or something to go pull that in. And the screen might be made up of you know, a thousand different little pieces. So in the worst case, it can take 15 seconds for every last little bit of detail to come in. And I know we're gonna get dinged some by that, there are going to be people that I, uh, you know, that run up, and uh, if you want the the recipe to make it look as bad as possible, it's uh, kind of back your way into something with a high sensitivity. You know, walk around backwards through town, then flip around and look at something that you haven't had any chance to do, and it, it'll come in. It'll be blurry, and it'll come in, work its way in, and that's just the the reality of the way the technology works that we have to to deal with. But we do an awful lot of work to try and make this not an issue, and the great thing is that. When you sit back and you, know, you watch, uh, I'm having a great time over there looking at a dozen screens playing Rage, and you look at it and it looks great. And I catch myself doing this even at the office where I'm sitting at my desk with Visual Studio on one side and the game on the other, and I'm looking at something and twiddling the controller, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, this looks awful. Can't we do better at making something here, getting this in better, scheduling this, putting some hint in on that? And you know, I can, like, like any good engineer, I can almost depress myself about how much more we can do to make things better in the future. But then when I look at people playing the game, just even in the office running around doing the, the testing duties or whatever, you know, I'm back to, okay, that looks great. I'm really thrilled to see it running that good, see it behaving that way. And it's, you know, it's always a set of trade-offs in engineering where we, you know, we made these 
conscious decisions that we would live with some degree of textures coming in to give us this, this painterly world. We would give up on uh, completely general purpose dynamic lighting. We wouldn't. Is that my microphone problem? Have you had that too? Okay. Bug in the mic. We have a report of a bug in the microphone system, so we'll see if this is better. So um, aside from the actual, the raw nature of it as far as bringing the, the textures in in these little pieces, the code that does this is certainly the most intertwined, sophisticated, and highly optimized code in the engine, where there's actually up to four levels of locality for how these textures come in. At the, uh, at the closest level to the hardware, everything is broken up into these little blocks of textures. Uh, instead of being one wall that's 2,000 by 1,000 and a coffee cup that's 128 by 128, everything is uniformly divided up into pages of textures, you know, 128 by 128 blocks. And it's interesting how this has gone from five years ago when I first sort of did this technology. Originally, I did something for splash damage for enemy territory, and then I generalized it for our early work in Rage. We ran the numbers and we looked at it and said, well, okay, this current generation of hardware, you can have textures that are 4,096 by 4,096. So we break that up into you know, 1,000, 128 by 128 pages, and that should be able to cover everything that we want to do, where you know, you've got about a million pixels on the screen and 16 million pixels there. 16x should be sufficient margin for us. And in the early things that we did, like the, the many years ago demos of the Dusty 8 racetrack where you run around uh, this reasonably confined area, all that was working quite well. It seemed that uh, we had the numbers, it was going pretty quickly, uh, all the data sets seemed to fit, and, uh, and it looked like the technology was going to settle down reasonably quickly. We had sets of optimizations that we had to do. But one of the, the somewhat fateful things that happened uh, a little bit after that, and Tim and Matt still uh, ribbed me a little bit about this, where the artists started designing things that weren't these sort of big deformed facades, uh, which is the most comfortable thing for the technology. Like if you, if you want this mega texture stuff to work great, work efficiently, you take sort of a, a big sheet and push it around something so that you've got uh, one, we call it a texture island, one contiguous area of textures on there. And it's super efficient at doing that. It works really well, runs extremely fast. But the artists started building some really impressive scenes using different construction techniques where they would build all these little modular Lego pieces and throw them together. And then instead of having this great big sort of terrain mesh of things built up into building facades, we have thousands and thousands of disconnected little pieces of textures. And we're like, okay, we can, we can deal with this. We'll lay them all out, crunch them together, and see what we get out of this. And it was starting to look a lot more challenging. And the, the designers were beginning to say, well, we need some guidelines and some limits. I, you know, how many, what can we do? Tell us what our, our guidelines are. And as a programmer, that's always a really hard thing to have a designer come up and say, because the answer is, it's really complicated. I, you, know, you can have a lot of triangles here if, I, you know, if you don't have a lot of dynamics, and you can trade off like your overdraw with your particles against I, you know, your texture load here. If you flatten all of this out, you can have a ton of triangles. And you know, I would go on like this, and then everybody's like, give us a number. I, and I, I hemmed and hawed, and I really made a really bad call, and I said, well, you know, I want to be pushed a little bit, so go, you know, go make really cool stuff, and we'll figure it out. And I, you know, and, and in the end, we, we pretty much did, but there is a whole lot of hard work buried in uh, making all of that stuff actually work. Um, to get back to the, the kind of layers of complexity on all of this, so at the top level, we've got this 4K by 4K page of textures all broken up into little blocks. And those are all puzzle piece fit around on the screen. And PC guys will be able to, you know, you'll be able to bring down the console and turn on all the little debug tools and peek at how these textures are actually broken up. Uh, it pains me a lot that, the, that Microsoft and Sony completely disallow the ability to plug in a keyboard and, you know, and tweak with things. It's, it's even a pain for us in development that our full retail builds, we can't bring down and play with debug tools. And I think that's, that's unfortunate and to not any particularly good benefit. Uh, but as it is, only PC people get to tweak around with, with that stuff. But so on, I, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I'll get him. So at its best, the areas like five years ago, I was thinking things would turn out. If you're in the wasteland and you're in a canyon and it's, you know, you've got the cool sunlit stuff up there, if you look at it, you can kind of look around and say, okay, I've got this wall here, I've got my 80 degree field of view, I can look around and pretty much your entire view, you could turn 360 degrees and all of that fits in that sort of 4K by 4K set of pages. So once they're loaded in, you flip around and everything looks great all the time. Uh, it runs into more problems when you get into these really sophisticated scenes where the thing that hurts us, if you've got the floor underneath you, you can clearly see this is broken up. Okay, 128 pixels, this block here, this takes up this much memory, everything's great. What's a problem is when you look at this awesome set piece over there and you've got all these tiny little things where there's no page, the minimum page size is this block of 128 by 128 pixels. If you've got a railing that occupies one pixel on the screen, you may still need a full page wrapped around that even if you're only seeing one slice of it. Uh, we do our best to go ahead and pack things in nearby and I, you know, and try to, to minimize complete wastage like that, but it also gives us some false sharing and limits what we can do with anisotropic filtering and all of these things. So the bottom line is it turns out that the single 4K by 4K page wasn't nearly enough. And on the PC, you just crank it up and you say, well, I'm gonna use 8K by 8K pages because all the video cards are, you know, have plenty of memory now and that's what you do. And we built a lot of the game like that. And then when we're like, okay, now it needs to actually work on the 360 and the PS3, and people start looking, it's like, oh, this is like, it's half the detail that it was on the PC, this is missing MIP levels and all that. And we go through this process of saying, well, uh, the 360 can actually support an 8K by 8K texture. We wouldn't really have enough RAM to do that, but if I was left to my own on that, we'd allocate that space and then overlay other things in the, the parts of the texture we're not using. All that great stuff you can't do on PCs because you're at too much of a distance from the hardware. But the PS3 uh, doesn't even have that capability at all. So you're stuck with these odd notions of, well, do we try and put them in a cube map so we can have six sides, maybe a six side 2K by 2K, but the addressing on that would be a huge pain. Do we try using a 3D texture with multiple slices, but then the performance goes to hell on there. And we wound up with multiple independent images where we start off with this, this wonderful, beautiful, elegant virtualized system. Everything flows into all of this, multiple pages, and it's nice and clean and sounds good. And we wind up with three different page images of different sizes and different depth complexities. And uh, some of them have uh, just one DXT image. Some of them have three. Uh, and the, Vim, uh, the virtual materials on the dynamic things are handled separately. So all of this complexity comes in when you go from kind of the initial cool, elegant demo of something to getting it through, delivering what your artists and designers want and getting it out onto a shipping project. So lots and lots of work went into doing that about making this thing that originally really was not that complicated. Uh, the initial, you know, it was only a, a small number of days to do the first sort of virtualization of texturing and you know, a few weeks to a few months to get something where like, okay, look, this level's running with virtual textures, it doesn't load anything at the start, but it's taken years and years to get to the point where we have all the capabilities that we really want. So here we are at the point with all these broken up little, textile, little uh, texture blocks on there. If we loaded them directly from the DVD or even the hard drive at that point, you would have a significant lag. You'd be going around, every time you turned a little bit, it would have to bring in a whole row of pages. And that doesn't work particularly well. We started off on the PC with that, where if you have a ton of memory and you look at everything once, after you've gone through it, it stays sort of in your buffer cache, and that's not too terribly bad. But on the consoles, we had to manage everything ourselves. So we have our own second layer cache that sucks up pretty much all the available memory in the consoles where we load in the stuff that we need and then every bit of extra memory is available for caching this. Uh, we wound up also using that for audio caching. So uh, if something's present in there, if you've got lots of memory, then it comes back in super fast. It has to go through the transcode pipeline, but uh, a lot of the instance maps, if you're playing things that aren't the wasteland, we've got quite a bit of memory and that fills it up. And once you've sort of looked at something, it stays in there resident and comes in really quickly. 
but the wasteland was our real push case on here where it was hard to just get that to fit at all on the consoles and we don't have nearly as much stream file cache as we would like. And this is an area where uh, the PS3 has a good bit less memory available than the 360 because it's got a split memory space where instead of saying, well, you use as much textures as you want and the rest of it's available for other things, you say half of it is available for graphics and half of it is available for CPU stuff, which turns out not to be that bad for us because we almost completely, on our high memory case, max that out. So it didn't hurt too much but their operating system takes uh, a good chunk of extra memory that we wish that we could use for stream file cache on there. But still, once you've got everything in memory, that works pretty good. But if you're coming straight from the hard drive, then the first time you walk into everything, you're, or from the DVD, worst case, or Blu-ray, even worse, in terms of uh, total latency time, um, you know, you're stuck with this very long have to go it's, it's the epitome of the physical action going on in here where so much of this is just ethereal software shoving things around, but you listen to that Blu-ray churning around as it seeks around pulling everything in. Like, it'll be nice when we don't have that little physical element that we have to be scheduling for and working around. So to avoid the worst cases in that, we added another level of caching where we have a hard drive backing cache where the first time you look at something, it takes the long trip in from the DVD or the Blu-ray, then it gets written back out to a fast area on the hard drive, so we can bring it back in the next time from the hard drive instead of from the DVD. So it's sitting in the stream file cache, then eventually it gets transcoded and put onto the actual texture that the GPU touches, that then puts it onto the screen. So four levels of locality there before it gets to the screen. Optical media, hard drive backing cache, uh, stream file cache, texture, and it gets yet more complicated by the fact that on systems that do have a hard drive, on the PS3 and uh, in particular, we get to install some of our textures to the hard drive. On the 360, we don't have a partial install option. It's all or nothing, which is kind of unfortunate, which means you have to install 21, 22 gigs of stuff, which takes a long time. But if you've got it and you're going to play it on a 360, that's the way to go. It makes a significant difference. Everything comes in without having to hit optical media. Uh, on the PS3, we install some of the important things on there, and we're still negotiating with Sony on exactly how much space that we can take. Um, so Bethesda's kind of trying to twist arms to say, it's like, well, you can give us a couple more gigs because we'll be able to then stick this other page file on here, and that'll, be, uh, you know, that'll make the, that part of the experience that much better. Uh, to start touching on one of the, if only we had a little bit more time or had worked on it earlier, the better solution for that would have been to split our page files and say, okay, all of the low detail stuff goes onto the hard drive cache and then all the high detail stuff stays on the Blu-ray, uh, possibly backed by the, the temporary hard drive cache. Because then you would never have the, you know, the grotesquely ugly cases where you just like, oh, you know, what is that? blurry mess for a quarter second that you can get when it's coming straight from optical media. But that's, again, it's the most sophisticated code in there, and to some degree we cringe a little bit every time we, we try to implement some new feature in there because it is, uh, it's at the heart of the most asynchronous threads, you know, all the different devices. There's one thread that's dealing with reading from the DVD, one thread reading from the, the hard drive. There's additional threads doing the analysis of the feedback buffer to figure out what it needs to do. And then there's a bunch of threads doing the transcoding where it comes in, if we had infinite space, I, we would have just stored everything out directly as it was gonna go into the texture. You know, that would have been great. You could do an unbuffered read directly off of the file, directly into the texture, and the GPU could be using it immediately. But unfortunately, that would have meant that the game would have been either less than half the current size, or you, know, you don't want a deck of eight DVDs to play a game there. Uh, and that's sort of the data set that we would be looking at there. So we have on, uh, on distribution media, everything is compressed using an HD photo uh, derivative on there, and we actually, Microsoft gave us a license to use uh, stuff derived from their, uh, their code base for that, which, uh, which was a really good thing on there. We, we have our own DCT-based version, but it just was this significant 30% or more not as good as what we could get from there. So 30% of the quality that we were able to pack onto there, onto the existing disks, uh, is due to having a more sophisticated encoding method. But of course, that also means it takes twice the processing power to do that. So we have all this work where we bring this in, 
comes in in this HD photo derivative, gets sent out to a whole bunch of threads, decompressed to a, you know, a YCOCG color space on there, but then we have to recompress it and re-encode it to DXT for the, uh, for the actual video cards on there. And that's one of the things that, there's a number of things that we may get to do on future PC releases for potential higher quality. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, the PC version will, will street the same time the other versions, but because it's a, uh, it's a Steam release on that, we get to work on the PC version longer, so we're hoping to get uh, a good bit more tuning in on that before we finally get it out. And it is extremely frustrating knowing that the hardware that we've got on the PC is often 10 times as powerful as the consoles, but it's honestly been a struggle in many cases to get the game running 60 frames per second on the PC like it does on a 360. Uh, you know, a lot of it's driver overhead issues where there's so much that we do in the game that all of this dynamic texture updating where on the console we say, all right, we've got a new page of data. We put that page in there and then we update the page table that points to that. And on the console, that may just be a matter of writing an int to a memory. It's like, here's the texture. Let's calculate exactly where this part of the page table is. And then we just poke it right in there. On the PC, that turns into uh, you know, potentially a, a text sub-image 2D. And if you're a programmer and you start single-stepping through that, you'll cry. You won't make it back out. It'll just take forever that it'll be going in there. And that's where we're looking at that on the console. We just, we put the memory in there. We just, that's what it is, that's where it goes, and we stick it there. Uh, you know, and there's reasons why PCs are like that. They have to work with very different memory architectures. You know, the tiling and swizzling formats are different between them. Uh, but we may be seeing some light at the end of that tunnel where there have been enough kind of hints from the relevant vendors that maybe it is time to start standardizing on some in-memory footprint and formats so that PCs can be a little bit more efficient at some of this. And especially we're leaning on Intel where I, Intel's current graphics hardware is getting decent. Uh, you know, it's not going to... <laughs> No, it's not going to be a, no, I mean, this is the embedded hardware that everybody has just dismissed. You've forgotten you had it in your, uh, in your systems because you went out and you bought a serious, uh, you know, NVIDIA or AMD video card on there. But, uh, you know, it's been there for running people's Word apps and whatever for a long time, but each generation, it gets better. And at the current generation, we have Rage running on the Intel hardware now. It's not 60 frames per second yet, but we're looking at this as... It's not, yeah, people still laugh when Intel hard, uh, integrated graphics comes up, but it's not going to be long before you are really going to be able to actually use that. And I know that's, I, you know, that's certainly making the, the dedicated video card manufacturers a little bit antsy on some level because there's clear trends going on there. But the important aspect from that is because it's an integrated memory part, unified memory, there's no reason that it shouldn't be like a console. It's all in one same set of memory. I should be able to get the address of that texture. I should be able to get the stride and the and swizzle format and say, all right, I want my texture update. I'm just going to go push it in there. And we have sort of notional buy-in from Intel that this is a good direction. I mean, old-time graphics people still... Um, you know, they cringe at the idea of exposing internal formats. Uh, there's, you know, a long culture of being able to do things behind people's back that really has led to a lot of grief in the PC graphics industry. The fact that, uh, you know, DirectX sort of pretended you could lock a rectangle of an image, but what happened in most cases what behind, was behind your back, drivers were, like, copying the whole texture in and out, re-swizzling it, pretending it was like this for you, and then doing the inverse to put it back into video memory. And that's where... It's a leaky abstraction. It's where we're trying to pretend that all these graphics hardware behaves in a certain way when they really don't. And for a lot of things, abstraction's great. You want to be able to step back and say, here, we're doing one thing, we want it to behave, just with slightly varying characteristics. But when you're doing really aggressive, real-time operations, uh, sometimes those abstractions will really kill you. And it's... I. You know, it's happened to us over and over again where we take something, it's working fine on the consoles. Uh, there are these open questions of, well, do you want to use parameter buffers, texture reads, all these different possible ways that you might go about doing it. And I can look at a, a hardware reference manual and say, well, it should be able to just DMA fetch the stuff in like this. It should be able to be poked in here. Uh, but often they have to go through incredibly convoluted things in the driver 
to work around that. And there's good reasons why that stuff happens. I mean, one of the things that I, you know, that I'm to blame for that I, I regret a lot is there are, uh, there are hacks in all current graphics drivers to identify whether you're playing early versions of Quake because I did things like uh, when I was getting the extension string, I just had a buffer of like, oh, you know, a thousand characters should be enough for all the extensions. And we do a, you know, copy a geo get string into there. And of course, as drivers got to the point where they had tens of thousands of characters of extension strings that would just stomp all over memory. And they went in behind our backs to our benefit and said, well, if we identify that you're playing this game, we're just not going to do this. We'll do this other thing. We'll give you a shortened list that, you know, that fits what you're expecting. So there's reasons, there's archeological reasons why PC drivers have a lot of the stuff that they do, but it is very unfortunate that they have to rely on such an overwhelming amount of brute force to, uh, you know, to overcome the console's low level advantage there. But again, there's, there's signs that things may be getting a little bit better there. Uh, I'm hoping that we will have, uh, just as, like to speak to another success point on here, uh, it is kind of nice only having I uh, sort of three relevant graphics vendors to work with on on this. In the old days, you know, in the Quake 3 time frame, there were there were 20 different people making graphics chips and we kind of had, you know, we were sort of on top of all of that, but a lot of them should not have been writing graphics drivers. You know, you had a clear uh, separation between the the professionals that knew what they were doing and the, you know, and the companies that didn't. And right now, Everybody working in the industry at a high level knows what they're doing. They have the, you know, the intelligent conversations about things. And we can reach agreement on a lot of things where we had, uh, talking about 60 frames per second swap interval stuff, where what we do on the consoles, and you can, you can probably catch sights and signs of this uh, if you play the games aggressively. Uh, we try to be 60 frames per second, swapping exactly with the swap interval all the time, but we monitor a lot of things and we adjust the game's behavior in the rendering side. We resolution scale when it looks like we might be going over 60 frames per second. So we've got all this dynamic resolution scaling going on, but there's still cases where uh, you know, we can't predict that all this, well, we talked about trying to do some more uh, not so much predictive, but uh, like when explosions go off on there, we really we should have been able to inform the renderer that that's going on and preemptively scale it down a little bit. That's another one of those things that we, you know, we should evolve towards a little bit more. But right now it's reactive, where as you're running through the scene and it gets more and more complex or more and more heavy with particle overdraw, it slowly scales the resolution down and usually you won't even notice. But when something unexpected happens, like something just jumps into view from offside and massive explosions and after effects go off, uh, we can miss the target frame rate. What we do then is we allow it to go ahead and instead of having the classic PC problem where either you choose swap interval locked and you get into this ugly awful stuttering when you're not quite 60 frames per second, you're bobbling between 30 and 60 and doesn't feel very smooth at all, or you just accept the tear line as kind of the standard in high speed PC play, which really is one of the more objectionable graphics artifacts that we deal with now. So what we have now is on the consoles, we proved this out first where you're locked as long as you're going 60 frames per second. And as soon as you miss 60 frames per second, then you get some tear lines. And uh, hopefully our dynamic adaption and everything catches in and uh, a couple frames later, the tear line just kind of runs back up to the top of the screen and it stops tearing again. And it was really good that we were able to make the case to uh, NVIDIA and AMD, and I think Intel is even going to, uh, going to address this as well, uh, that look, this is an important thing. We are obsessing over some relatively unimportant things with sizes of filter kernels and, uh, and the other things that graphics geeks can go on about forever, but we've got this stupid ugly tear line going down the screen or we've got this non-isochronous swap behavior. Uh, this is actually an important thing to fix. And I, uh, you know, NVIDIA went in and put something together pretty quick and defined a, it's a little bit of a hackish interface where we didn't define anything new. We just said, well, negative swap intervals will mean I, uh, you know, swap to this if you can, otherwise tear. And uh, AMD looked it over and said they could do the same thing. And, you know, hooray, a success story for uh, kind of, you know, industry vendors cooperating on that. So, you know, that's been, uh, that's been actually pretty good, but we're still, we're gonna push, we've still got time to make some significant pushes on the PC side of things. Um, we do not have 
any crazy PC specific features that are going in on the rendering, but there's actually a lot of things in the near term, like initial shipping version of the PC, we need to tune how big we can make the textures where people that have multi gigabyte video cards, that 4K by 4K texture on the consoles, we should be able to turn that into a 16K by 16K texture so that, you know, once things are resident in that, you can make quite a bit of moving around without ever actually having to transcode anything else again. Uh, and that's stuff that we'll, we'll get that tuned up relatively soon. But I'm also looking forward to the possibility of uh, doing some almost research engine-like things that may be able to leverage some of the RAGE data. Kind of back to the, the old days where GLQuake came out where it was this completely unsupported thing that you just dropped this eeks in and ran this and it kind of showed you what I was playing with technology-wise with the existing data. And I'm, I'm thinking that I might be able to do some things like that, um, possibly with RAGE. You know, it is a little bit of a bigger deal considering the size of the company we are and all this where I'm not positive I can get away with just here completely unsupported, but play around, it might be kind of neat. You know, it might look stupid in some places. Uh, but that's, that's something that I'm thinking about because there are, there are the far out technologies that I'm looking at and all the, you know, the different ways of representing things, whether you want to do tracing and splatting and voxels and non-polygonal stuff, but you know, that's still relatively, that's not what we're working on right now. And I'm interested to see how far we can take our current data sets. You know, if we say, here's what we've got, how good could we make it look by essentially changing the technology? Because we really don't want to reinvent our entire content pipeline again. Because again, it took, you know, the demo of, look, a virtual texture, it's over five years ago. Uh, you know, it took five years to get everything that goes into this for how we create the stuff, how our back-end processing, and how we distribute all of this. It takes a long time to go from demos to you know, production work. And the, the cold, hard truth is every game that we've done that's come out of id Software proper on our mainstream mainline has taken longer than the game before, and that cannot continue. You know, it's, it's always well and good. You plot trends and say, you know, look, an exponential curve. I, you know, there's a whole bunch of areas like this where I, you can say, well, that means that uh, you know, three generations down the line, we'll be taking 30 years to create our next game. <laughs> I, but as is always the case, <laughs> if something can't go on forever, it won't. And it's all a matter of how you do the landing from can't go on forever that determines how you're going to come out of it. You don't want to crash land. You want to go ahead and ramp that off in some way for a nice, smooth, flared landing. Um, so that does have impact on how we look at our technology development going forward. And you know, I've said for years now that I think that we are past the knee of the curve in terms of what we get from graphics technology on there. There's no doubt that graphics still matters. I am, you know, it's rage looks spectacular, but we made conscious choices that, okay, it could have looked more spectacular and we could have been a 30 frames per second game like most of the competition, but uh, we decided early on, although it was a hard fought battle, which uh, at this point, despite all the pain and suffering that we went through, I think everybody's real happy that, that we did make the call that we did. Uh, it did involve a lot of suffering on art design and programming side, but that initial choice to say, we can do fancier graphics, you know, there are techniques that we can apply that will make the game look better, but I'd rather have twice the frame rate. And I think that we are, that question of how we spend our resources, uh, there's a lot of options on there on what we want to do with it. Um, so technology-wise, I'm going to do more research engines. Uh, you know, I've got a handful of little things that, I, that I'm tinkering with. I've actually, uh, there are still people at the office right now making our cert candidates, but uh, it's mostly of the, uh, like, what do you do when you're at the disk swap and somebody sends you a multiplayer invite and you yank out your memory card? You know, what do you do? Um, <laughs> so we're, we're, the main game part is done. And I've actually stepped a little bit away. And there are still people there that are, that are there all night working on getting the stuff done. But I actually opened up another little project and started writing some new code I, relatively recently to start exploring some things. And that's, I, you know, it's nice to be able to start looking at, uh, at some additional things. But uh, it's possible that some of these research engines might turn into other things to do on the PC with the game. Uh, certainly, 
We're not going to try and recertify a game with some fancy new rendering technology, but I'm interested in seeing what it looks like if we take the content that we've created now and say you make perfect anti-aliasing or perfect motion blur, or you just really do sort of the speed of light calculation here where you say if everything was how we wanted it to and this was the data that you had to work with, what could you get out of it? And it's an open question of how compelling that would be. Uh, we do have 10 times the horsepower on the PC that we have on the consoles. If we, you know, and we are using the PC as just a sort of a muscular console in this point. We're not doing uh, anything radically different. There's not, uh, you know, DX11 tessellation or anything in there. Uh, I don't believe really in bolt-ons like that. Uh, I think it's something that you have to design for from the beginning, and we did not choose to go that route on this generation. But if we want to throw these ridiculous amounts of power at it, and it is, you know, it's crazy how much power we have. To, I spend a lot of time just uh, smiling and being amazed at how, uh, how much computing horsepower that we have to look at with these. Uh, you know, the high-end graphics cards, you've got at least 10 times the power of the console. And I know in previous years I've talked about how we've got this factor of a million where I've gone from, uh, like, the first game that I wrote to what we're doing now. You know, a million times more power. But the interesting thing was uh, a month or two ago we had a case where I actually looked at it and said, this is a factor of a billion, where I was spending a I was spending a little bit of time reading about things that were before my time, like Atari 2600 programming. And the internet is so awesome. You know, you can go and, you know, look at, uh, you know, program code and ROMs and things that people have written and disassembled of all these ancient systems. And, and that was the system from when I was a kid. Uh, I never programmed for the 2600. I knew a few people that overlapped my development space that, uh, you know, that did do some work there. But it was, uh, it was an incredibly primitive machine you had 128 bytes of RAM and 2K of ROM on the early cartridges. You know, later with all their fancy bank switching, they got it up to, you know, an amazing 16K of ROM on the, the highest, most expensive cartridges. So, you know, it was fun reading about all of this, and I, you know, it's again one of those things where if I only had a bunch more time, I'd like to go, you know, do a, a little test app and uh, try out certain things on there, but not likely to happen. I, but still, you go and look at that and say 128 bytes of RAM. One of the things that we were doing in our production side of things for cranking out our build games to rebuild all the games, um, when we build our virtual textures for the, uh, the dynamic stuff, it's this process that at one point it just took hours. I rewrote it to, to be such a way that it used uh, huge amounts of memory mapped files and it got down much, much faster, but it really swapped, uh, started swapping on any system that we had. So we said, well, let's find out what the, you know, what the actual limitations here are. So we took one of our servers and we put 192 gigabytes of RAM in it. And, and it was, so it's like $5,000. We used to spend more than $5,000 on a desktop PC. You know, we had $10,000 workstations back in the day, but 192 gigabytes of RAM. And I think back, okay, 128 bytes of RAM in the Atari 2600, 192 gigabytes of RAM being used to build this, you know, greater than a factor of a billion. Now that's stretching from, uh, you know, before my time to a server grade system here, but it's still, you know, it's nine orders of magnitude, you know, where do you see that in anything else? And you also see it on, you know, the storage going from 2K to, I mean, two terabyte drives are pedestrian. You know, that's uh, another factor of a billion there. So that's, you know, pretty amazing to look at that. And we've got a lot more yet to come. I mean, certainly serial clock speeds have, you know, have pretty much petered out. We're going to see a little bit more on that. But the, the massive multi-core performance that we're getting, uh, and certainly all the experience with the GPUs, uh, we're going to be seeing more orders of magnitude coming yet. So the big question is, as game developers, what do we want to do with those? Um, there's some obvious cases where, as we look at throwing things up for, uh, you know, for high-end PCs or next-gen consoles, uh, there's the immediately clear stuff. You say, well, instead of running at 720p, I'm going to run at my 
you know, 2.5K by, uh, by whatever high def PC monitor on there, you know, there's a factor of three or start running multiple monitors, take it up to maybe a factor of 10 there. You go ahead and run your 4X or 8 or 16X multi-sample fragment anti-aliasing. You take everything out to much higher dynamic ranges on there. And all of those are the obvious things where you're just cranking knobs that already exist. Uh, there are things that are beginning to look possible on this level of hardware where I am looking at this thinking, you know, I guess we can do a full fast Fourier transform on the entire damn screen and do full screen convolutions of things where instead of having our flares be these sprites and blurred things that we have on there, you know, we can convolve the whole damn screen with this giant starburst and have every little pixel come in right. Uh, you know, that might be interesting. That seems like an almost criminal way to spend that many floating point operations for a post-process operation. But, you know, if they're there and we don't have, and we don't come up with something more compelling to use them for, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, there are, you know, there's a lot more that we can do with anti-aliasing and filtering. We can certainly continue cranking up more polygons, uh, more texture density. Uh, but we are at some of those points with texture density where another thing that Rage will, will get knocked for, if you go and you, you, know, you jam your face into a wall, the textures are going to be blurry. It's, we don't have detail maps on top of them. We are, uh, in many cases, at a little bit lower resolution than, uh, than a game that just tiling textures would be at. And it would be, it would be nice to address that, uh, but... It's likely that I'm not expecting anything to supersede Blu-ray in the, the real near future. Uh, the world's moving towards digital distribution in a lot of ways. Uh, DVDs are definitely annoying to have to swap DVDs to get what we want on here. Uh, you know, another of the things that I, I, I do have to watch myself a little bit on some of these. Like, I'm going to say some things that I know are going to get taken out of context, and, uh, and I may regret a little bit later, but the... Uh, I wish that we had had the time to, to max out a double layer Blu-ray DVD for the PS3. Um, right now we deliver the same content across all of it. And realistically it's not just a matter of saying, oh, you know, we could have just done this. It would have been a lot of effort and it would have, our build process, we're down to the wire as it is. We, you know, we would have been courting failure if we had tried to do this. But it would have been nice to have twice the data there that we could have pulled out from uh, without our artists having to draw anything different. We could have changed our compression ratios and the way we call the detail out. Um, and that could have offered some better view there. But on the other hand, the Blu-ray is the slowest seeking device and the PS3 has the least available memory. So it's not completely clear what, um, you know, what benefit we might have had off of that. But that's another thing I'd like to do on the PC is uh, we... I would hope that we could make some kind of DLC that maybe we take one level and we encode it at 10 times the bit rate or something. So like here's one level, but it's, uh, you know, it's two gigs or something rather than the, the 500 megs or uh, three to 500 megs that we make each individual thing uh, just to see like what's the extra benefit. Because I do think that if you're just running around playing the game, like if you watch everybody playing over there in the, the hall, doesn't make a whole lot of difference. But when you stop and you want to like really appreciate it, there would be an extra level of appreciation that we could get there. And it's I uh, so that's another thing that we may try to do on the PC, you know, higher data higher rate data sets, uh, you know, larger pages that we wind up pulling the stuff into. But there's I uh, it's worth talking a little bit about how we pull all of this data in where the shipping game, obviously, it fits on one Blu-ray disc. It's 20-something gigs uh, that you wind up putting into everything. Uh, but the source data is so, so much larger than that. The, uh, the textures that, that go together to build, uh, that are the source art that go into building the mega textures, uh, we, we ran into a limit where it ran out of a 256,000 by 256,000 texture where everything was fit into there. And that's all the source art, the, the mountainsides, the ground, the stamps, and everything that goes, that gets built into, or that gets baked into the, the textures that actually ship. And you look through that, so that's, uh, that's 64,000, so that's 64 gigatexels of source data, and each one is three channels, uh, or three images of three or four channels on there. It's 12 bytes on there. So with MIPMAPS, that's a terabyte of source art that goes into making the content that goes and ships on the one Blu-ray or three DVDs. 
Now, the, when we build the levels, it takes that source art and combines it with all of the lighting and, uh, and builds these final outputs, which are between, the biggest levels are 128 by 128. Uh, the dynamic characters, I think, all fit in a 64K by 64K. And the individual, the wasteland is 14 pieces. It wouldn't fit even in one 256 by 256. It's about 14 pieces of various sizes from 32K to you know, up to 128K for parts of it. So what we do to make all of this fit, at the top level, we build out all of this. And if we shipped all of that completely uh, uncompressed in RGB format, it would be you know, many, many, it's like 100 gigs or so for what we would start off on that. So to get that down, we obviously have the, the HD photo compression. We digest everything down. Uh, that saves a lot. But uh, we get a large amount by profiling where the player can go. So another thing that you can do in the PC version, bring down the console, no clip up, and you, you fly up and you look at some rooftops on there and you say, it's like, oh, the rooftops are all blurry. Uh, well, that's because we have these surfaces where we map out where the player is supposed to be able to go. And we view, you know, we profile zillions of views from all these places and say, well, these are the images that we need at this resolution. And the ones that are further away, they get, you know, lower and lower resolution. And that hurts a little bit where it's baselined on uh, like a 720p image. So if you're running on a, uh, a PC at really high resolution, if you see something that has, like if you're in town and you can walk all the way up to it, if you're across town, you'll get all of your resolution in there. It'll use it all up. But if you're looking at something that the player can't actually approach, like the top of a guard tower or something, where the player can't walk up there, when you walk up on your three megapixel PC monitor on there, unfortunately the texture data just doesn't exist to have the higher quality data there, so it winds up being a little bit blurrier. Again, if we, uh, you know, if we ever, do get to have some kind of a downloadable super quality pack something in some area, it would be nice to have some of that extra stuff there. Uh, because it was, it was painful and disappointing during development where at the start we were developing all on the PC and the artists were building stuff. And when we finally kind of showed them, it's like, well, we have to go through all this texture compression stuff and this is what it's gonna look like on the game. There were some sad faced artists looking at, uh, at all of this, but once they start you know, working with it, it's still, it's just, it's a factor you have to take into effect. Um, you know, and that also, uh, one of the other sort of related to that is we have areas that are, my crusade for years, I've always been about id games are dinged appropriately for being far too dark. Uh, you know, the dark areas where you can't see what's going on, you, you're supposed to, of course the artists are like, well, turn off your lights, play in the dark room, that's the way it's supposed to be played. Uh, but in reality, lots of times, if people would look at Doom 3 and you'd play it and just not see half of the stuff that's there. So we made a conscious effort to brighten things up, but some of the stuff that would happen during development on Rage is we have real lights and then we've got our post-processing effects on there. And sometimes we'd use, we have arguments about the, the usefulness of post-processing. There's lots of people that really love it. I, a lot of times I'm looking at something and I bring down the console and like turn off post-processing. I'm like, wow, this looks so much better. Uh, you know, crisper and clearer, you can see all the detail, the colors aren't messed up. But I, you know, I lost that battle uh, pretty clearly where there's, there's lots of post effects going on throughout the game. And lots of times it does convey the right mood and it does all of this, but it does a lot of damage to all of this, tech, this data that we spent. We killed ourselves to get it compressed over there and then to have some post process go in and muck up all the pixels uh, is sometimes a little bit uh, depressing in some ways. But uh, with all of this data that we've got on there, again, it's, it would be terabyte plus going on there. Gets fully, yeah. <laughs> uh, now this is actually uh, having a game to talk about. I don't know how, I've got a bunch of things that I want to go into and then the Q&A, but there's, uh, there's a lot involved just in Rage. Uh, but I probably should kind of push on to some other topics here. The, uh, one of the real interesting things about the development this year that happened over the course of the last couple of years um, I spent a lot of time with static software analysis tools, and it's, it's been an eye-opening experience for me where all the good programmers I know, everybody has a goal of you want to write good software. You want to do, it's your craft, it's what you do. You want to make sure that it's high quality and efficient and does a good job. 
but those are you know, are very kind of vague, hand wavy things, you know. I, but it's still you could say that that's kind of the, the mantra. You want to write good software, but there are so much the individual styles that people have to develop. I, there are, are have been plenty of studies and analyses of things, but there are certain ways of doing things where that are more or less error prone. And getting into a programming language discussion, it's it's a religious war sort of thing. If you try and tell someone that their favorite operator is error prone, then they'll be like, only for bad programmers. You know, good programmers will use it right. And any tool you can shoot yourself in the foot with uh, on this. But I. Uh, but it's been enlightening to have a lot of analysis tools to look at our, our large code base, where it was different when it was just uh, like me and my right-hand man uh, working on the code at id. We have uh, the id, when I send something out to id programmers, our alias, it goes to 49 people. They're not all programmers that are, there's, some of them are people that just want to be informed on what we're doing on there. But when we look over our, uh, you know, our two big teams and the two or two smaller teams involved in doing different things. There's a lot of people that wind up uh, writing code, touching code, committing to our, you know, our repository. And it winds up, uh, there's millions of lines of code. I, you know, I don't have, that's one of those things I, I sometimes miss just having a, a convenient word count on Windows. I haven't bothered to go and, and get real numbers, but uh, it's multiple millions of lines of code. And uh, we know that it, uh, we had one number where we initially tried using Coverity as a company that comes in, they do analysis of all of your code, and they, they gave us like 100 issues as a promo of, uh, you know, here's what, here's some things that our tool found in there. Uh, and they said, you know, it's a really high quality code base that this, uh, usually we find a bunch more things than this. And, you know, I preen a little bit at that, say it's like, that's, you know, it's great that we've got a good team of programmers on this. And uh, they wanted like $50,000 for this software tool. And if you thought that, well, it's going to save you uh, looking stupid when you ship your game on there, that's a completely reasonable thing. But we figured we would get back to, to looking into that when we got closer to shipping. But uh, later on, I started looking at some other tools, options that were available. And one of the really great things uh, available is Microsoft has some pretty high quality. They've got, Microsoft actually has, uh, a very interesting research department that does a lot of things. Microsoft Research has a, a lot of really smart people in and they do a lot of work covering a lot of different areas. But they productized some of their work that had been you know, research early on and they've got analyze options for the compilers. Now normally you only get that on your super ultra platinum premium $10,000 Visual Studio on there. But interestingly for the 360 uh, development kit everybody gets that option. Now, most developers are either aren't even aware of it or don't want to turn it on, not don't want to deal with it. But it's an interesting thought over there where I guess you can draw the conclusion that Microsoft figures they're not going to get blamed for buggy PC apps, but they will shoulder some blame for buggy 360 apps. So they're going to make these tools that make significant differences available for free to 360 developers. Um, and I'll say this quite clearly with no hesitation. Any 360 developers that are listening to this, if you're not using Analyze, you are making a mistake. Uh, it is enlightening to see what happens when you turn this on. Uh, we found, so we had come out of this Coverity stuff with you know, 100 ish issues or so on there. Uh, we had certainly grown a lot of code since then. We had a lot of new programmers. But when we first turned on the Microsoft Analysis stuff, uh, it found hundreds and hundreds of things. Now, some of them are the cases where you get a programmer and say, that's not really an error, I know what I'm doing. Look, this guarantees that this doesn't make this happen and it's okay. And there were plenty of those, but there were also tons of things where you look at this and say, it's saying, uh, you know, potential null pointer access here. You're like, well, I'm checking up there, but nope, not checking down there, you're right. And when you see things like that happen over and over and over again, you know, hundreds of times, you start looking at this in a very different way because everybody thinks about programming and development where it's like, okay, you know, we, we bang the bugs out of it, we get the code good, now it's good solid stuff, uh, we'll, you know, we'll deal with things in maintenance. 
And there's, uh, when you talk about reliability theory uh, and different things that people ana analyze when they're talking about traditional like engineering structures, there's a lot of debate that goes into things about how well software is just different. You know, we can take our metals and we can uh, get our spread of ultimate tensile strengths and yield strength and do all of this. And this is how you look at failures. You add up all of these tolerances and you can do all of your analyses and figure out some estimate about how reliable it's going to be. But you can't look at software like that because software is supposedly deterministic. You know, either it works or it doesn't. It has no chance of failing uh, given the same input. And there's truth to that, and you can argue that in a certain way, but when you start looking at large enough bodies of software, millions of lines, dozens of developers, there does get to be a distressingly statistical nature to the amount of failures that you see where Software may be deterministic going through things, assuming you don't have uninitialized variables and randomized memory locations. Uh, but the development process of building that software is very much a statistical process where uh, every programmer in the company has, you know, has put things in that come out and that are just wrong. You know, you make them up and I, you know, I can't, before I got into the static code analysis, I did another exercise where I tried to keep a log of the personal errors that I made, where you write the code, you don't count the things just where you're compiling it, getting it to work and not blow up on the very first time that you, you know, you get it to run, but keeping a log of the things where, all right, I think it's working, and then you, all the things that you find days or weeks or months later that were actually wrong, and there were patterns in there, there were things that, that uh, I could see that I was doing where uh, a common paradigm, if you're dealing with pairs or triples of numbers, you've got like a dot x, a dot y, dot z, uh, it's very, very common to say, all right, copy that line, paste, 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 change the x's to y's and the y's to z's and, uh, and go through all of that. Happens all the time. There's tons of code that does that. But I noticed that, uh, you know, when I looked at this over six months, I had had three errors that crept through, um, you know, that were not immediately discovered, that only came up later, that was a result of not doing that particular thing right. And, and they were subtle things like, oh, the alpha channel was screwed up on this image that I never looked at because I was actually copying the blue channel because I didn't change a, w, a Z to a W or something. And something happens once, you say, well, it's an anomaly. You know, two or three times you start seeing trends and start looking and saying, well, what do you do to make this not happen? And in those cases, the obvious things are you use either you know, loops or, uh, or templates or objects or something so that you don't have this thing. You're you don't want to feel inclined to copy paste. But there are a lot of things like that that happen where uh, there are things that people just do every day. They may have done their entire career, been working for 20 years, uh, that just are error prone and are things that wind up uh, causing you problems as you go forward. And when we look at these larger teams with millions of lines of codes and so many developers, figuring out better practices uh, is really important. So we've, uh, I've really gotten behind the static code analysis. We have like the, the Microsoft Analyze tools are, are always on and they are warnings as errors. You can't build the game and run it if it complains about anything. And even when it's wrong, even when you've got something and you can prove and you can say, no, it's guaranteed okay because these interrelated things here, that's actually a good time to step back and say, you know, if you had to explain that to me, maybe you should change the way the code is working. If the analyzer can't figure it out, other programmers probably won't immediately figure it out and it will cause problems. And that's the other thing that you really notice when looking at things. I, you get a certain perspective if you take your little homebrew project that you've put together and you run it through certain tools, and lots of people will say, I don't need these stupid warnings. I, you know, I'll just figure it out, I know what I'm doing. And there's some truth to that, where uh, if you've gotta hack something together pretty quick, maybe you do want a dynamic language that's not gonna complain about types, that's not going to you know, I just kind of get in your way, and who cares if it doesn't work on lots of different things. If it just, sometimes you just want something done right now, and that's okay, and it's good to have tools that are efficient for that. But when you've got a code base that's gonna live for a long time, and I tell the programmers now that expect a lot of the code that you're writing, it's gonna be in use in some way 10 years from now. I, you know, there are bits of Quake 1 code that are in modern games. You know, nothing important, but there are, there are little lines that are still there. So you have to expect that uh, the code will last a long time, and when people start maintaining the code and adding features to it, 
things will break. And that's one of the patterns we see all the time, in the game code especially, where it's clear that they checked for, okay, I've got target, and my target enemy is not another player or this. Uh, but then later somebody says, well, we need this other feature. Let's, you know, let's make this do this under these conditions. So somebody writes some more code down there, but it doesn't have the same knowledge of preconditions up there, and that's when we wind up getting a game crash. Uh, you know, somebody winds up saying, it's like, oh, but I didn't expect that we would be changing weapons while I'm falling to my death, getting crushed by a vehicle that's targeting me or something like that. And those things really come back to bite you. So we are, uh, you know, we've got some healthy discussion going on about, uh, you know, different things that we can do in our programming languages to make things less error prone because it does come down to this. We have to figure out how to still do aggressive, awesome things in less time. You know, we cannot take eight years next time to make our next game. Some of that's content production, some of it's programming, a lot of it's design, picking your battles intelligently. But as programmers, there are a lot of things that we can do to not just say, write better code, take pride in your work, that's good and important, but you also have to start changing some of the things that you do and applying other tools that are sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes unpleasant. Uh, after Microsoft Analyze, I moved on to a couple other tools, you know, using PVS Studio, and uh, you know, then eventually I reached PC Lint, which is this program that's been around forever. You know, Lint was originally an early Unix program, and the interesting thing is, I was in my uh, a closet at my house looking at some things, and I noticed that I had like a, a version seven of PC Lint on, and I thought back and like, yeah, I did remember looking at that back in the Quake Three days. I ran some of the stuff, and that was back when there were three programmers involved with the project, and I, and it was also C instead of C++. And I remember going through that and saying, oh, this could help make quality stuff, it could be some improvements, but it didn't really stick. I didn't have that sort of conversion experience where clearly I'm seeing the massive value in static analysis that I do now. So I, we are completely squeegeed clean, error-free on Microsoft Analyze and PVS Studio, but PC Lint is, uh, you know, is another beast entirely where it's a lot higher noise to signal ratio where it can, it can complain about everything, you know, all sorts of pedantic stuff. And I had hoped that I would be able to, I, I got all of the errors out, and I was hoping I would be able to go through and at least look at and address every warning in there before shipping, but we weren't able to. There were still thousands of things, and a lot of them were clearly, I can say, well, all hundred of these are because we actually initialized something someplace else, but it gets back down to that. I'm doing that sort of hand-waving. It's like, yeah, it looks like that might happen, but it really can't, and I'm sure buried in those thousand warnings are some of those that really could happen. So we're trying to, you know, to, to write better code from the beginning in some ways, and I'm, I, I am considering some of the things that we're doing on the other project that I think leads the way here, uh, one of the lessons that we, we took away from Doom 3 was that script, script interpreters are bad from a, a performance debugging development standpoint on there. It's kind of that argument about, oh, but you want a freeform dynamically typed language here so you can do all of your fl quick flexible stuff and people that aren't really programmers can do this stuff. But you know, one of the big lessons of a big project is you don't want people that aren't really programmers programming. You'll suffer for it. Um, but one of the things that we did is, because the other side of it is also performance. You'd think that with our million times faster systems that it's like, ah, scripting some things, performance should be a non-issue. And it's, it's striking almost how much that isn't the case. I, you know, in the last month of Rage's development, we're taking some of our flash GUI stuff and converting it to C++ because the interpreter to, for doing the action script stuff in the GUI is taking multiple milliseconds sometimes. Even with all of our wealth of processing power, uh, we still don't have enough performance. Performance still matters. But even more than the performance now, I'm looking for these stronger guarantees on code quality. You know, I want us to be able to, you know, have full analysis trees that say, okay, you can still mess the game up by doing all sorts of different things, but what I want to be working towards is a case where we can say, well, the game cannot, uh, cannot have an exception of any kind with sufficient analysis through there. We're not there yet, but one of the interesting things that's going on is uh, Rage still has a little bit of script. Uh, we still have script that's derivative from Doom 3. It does a few things, but the bulk of the heavy lifting is just in-game code. Uh, you know, the, in Doom 4, we have what we call superscript, which is 
basically a way to do scripting in C++. It's a limited subset of it, but you get all the fiber goodness about being able to sleep and do the, the nice scheduling things that people always miss in scripting, but it's full performance and it's type safe and things like this where uh, I'm thinking that we may want to take that even a step further and go to a rigorously subsetted C++ dialect for writing the code because it comes back to the statistical awareness of we look over all the code base and mistakes are made every day. There are all of these things and it's, it's not because people are no good. The very best programmers always make mistakes and this is something that I've really internalized that no matter how good you think you are, you are making mistakes all the time. And you have to have structures around you to try and help you limit the damage that your mistakes will cause, find them as early as possible so that you can correct them. And the earliest possible time is to find them at compile time. So I'm, I, you know, I'm all about trying to be much more restrictive on what we can do here. And on the one hand, I would, I would entertain programming in I'm very tempted to want to move to a functional programming language, start programming in, you know, in Haskell or OCaml or something, but that's not a credible thing to do in the game industry because, again, 49 people on our list, I, I could probably convince a handful of them that we should, yeah, we should go convert to a new programming language, but then we're back into having performance issues in different cases, uh, having a huge educational and hiring problem, so we got to stay with something that's C, C++ based on there. But I think that we, I think that it would be worthwhile for 95% of our code to have hard restrictions in place to limit us to essentially the Java subset of C++ where I, you know, you have no unchecked arrays, you have no uninitialized pointers, you know, you have no use after free hazards, all of these things where you know, you look it all down and that's kind of the decisions that you make with Java, um, and then I'd even go a little bit beyond that. But it's one thing to say, I write all of my new code in this pseudo-functional style on there, but unless somebody, unless something is made impossible, it will still creep into your code base. So we probably need to be looking at being able to analyze our whole code base and say, okay, these hyper-performance, twitchy-tuned areas, they are go for it, do whatever the heck you want on here. But the vast bulk of the code, we want to be able to make stronger statements about it. And that's one of the big directions that, that I want to be looking at going forward. You know, the, we've learned a lot about the coding and the development, but it's still, if not, it still winds up being, right now, of course, the final cert issues, content is done, so programming still the long pole in the tent here. I, we could argue that if I, if we hadn't let ourselves be pushed so much on performance, uh, the programming would have been stable and could have been used earlier on that, but uh, unquestionably, it, wind, it still remains as one of the most important things. So looking at what we can do during our development process there is, uh, you know, is a pretty big deal. Uh, future research-wise, I've got one of the things, I've got the couple things that I'm looking into with using the current, uh, you know, the current direction of uh, our current data set because I don't think at this point that we can look at the next two games going to a completely different uh, development process. You know, we want a little bit more stability on there. It's possible, the way it might go is I do some fancy demo of some infinite detail technology on there and uh, everybody goes, oh my gosh, we really want to use that. But I think a lot of us at this point are looking back at Rage and saying, you know, if we had backed off a little bit, we could have shipped two games in this time, uh, time frame. And if, if you could turn back time, what I wish we had done is uh, taken something with id Tech 4, done another game. I mean, maybe we did a, you know, just rolled right into a Doom 4 there while Rage was under development and have a game every three years. I uh, but it's, I, we don't want to make that same huge long dead time. I mean, it's been great that everybody still comes to QuakeCon year after year, even though we hadn't shipped a game for six years. I, but I, we, we don't want to be in that position again in the future. And we had the partner companies, all of our work with Raven. It was, you know, we had our Quake 4 and our Wolfenstein. But uh, where we are right now, we want the, the big quality games coming out from the, the team under one roof. Uh, it's been... It's been quite a long journey, and the company has exploded in this last uh, the last couple of years. I think we're we're over 200 people now at the company. 
Uh, it is interesting having QA and production work uh, under our roof. One of the things that, uh, like our last game that we did with Doom 3, we're like, okay, it's a PC game, it runs, uh, burn it to a disc, hand it off to the publisher, and, and we're all done. Uh, it's a different world right now where we have the multi-platforms multi and all the translations that we're integrating in-house, and it, it sucks up a lot of additional people. There's a lot of extra work that goes into not just making the game, but delivering it on all of those, those areas. And I, I, I get asked a lot if I miss the old days of the smaller teams on there. And uh, this last year especially has been, uh, there have been so many anniversaries on this where we had uh, id Software's 20th anniversary, Quake's 15th, uh, I'm 40 years old, all of these big numbers that, uh, that go by. Uh, yeah, there was a recent graphics article uh, that I made a cameo as Old Man Carmack. Uh, <laughs> Uh, about time for me to grow a gray beard or something here, and that uh, you know it has been that path from I, uh, you know, from young whiz kid to uh, industry veteran. I guess there's a uh, what is it? There, there's a pattern that goes the the spectrum from young genius to old master as we've kind of walked along the the path there. But you know, I I have fond memories of a lot of the old days, but. The, what I've told the reporters over and over is I'm really a remarkably unsentimental person. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the good old days because I see this a lot. The good old days are right now. Uh, Rage is the best game we've ever made. Uh, I'm enjoying my programming as much now as I ever have. I'm a better programmer than I ever was. Uh, it's, you know, I, I have... I have this extra release that a lot of people don't have is that I get to go spend a little bit of time working on mobile projects each year. And I had, you know, I told Zenimax, it's like 10% of my time, that's what I'll, I'll go and do this. And I busted that budget a little bit doing the Rage I, iOS app early on because historically the way the mobile stuff had worked is I got to go in and have my little retro moment where I'd, I'd go dredge back up uh, how you write a software rasterizer or how you program on you know, DX7 Clash GPUs, and I would sort of toss it over a wall and the, the mobile team would go build a cool game out of it. Uh, with Rage, because it was going to be the first thing people could publicly see about Rage, we made the decision that, uh, that I would stick with the project all the way through to shipping. And so there were a couple months that I didn't spend any time on the big projects. So I haven't actually touched Xcode or any mobile development since I, you know, since that shipped because that really did kind of overshoot uh, the time that I was supposed to be dedicating to all of that. But the, uh, it was interesting just the process of going back in the older technologies. And in almost all cases, I was able to go back and say, uh, you know, with all of this hindsight, some little part of my brain would still be working on those problems that I had in the early days. I was able to go back and say, all right, I've got four days. Let's write a little software rasterizing engine for all of this and plow through that. And that was, you know, it was a ton of fun to go back and explore the, the old space there and realize that uh, I really have learned a lot over the years. There are lessons that let me write better code than, than what I wrote back then, uh, even without the extra resources. And I do sometimes think that uh, there was a, as we moved offices recently, uh, we have bookshelves of old books and there was a, uh, a Commodore VIC-20 reference manual that I think I'd been carrying around since I was 12 years old or something that had just still wound up on a bookshelf at id. And one of the younger guys had made the comment that, you know, looking at that, how he doesn't know if the, the younger generation will ever have the same kind of in touch with the machine that I, uh, that our older generation, like pointing at me and Robert Duffy, had um, by having that sense of, here's the registers that make the machine go and knowing everything in there. And you know, my immediate reply was, yeah, but the new generation can you know, tie things together on web pages and do this amazing data access stuff and do absolutely incredible things with modern tools and infrastructure. And yeah, you do have 20 layers of crap between you and the machine, but it lets you do amazing things. And that's, you know, and that's all well and good. And it is progress. You know, I'm not yet a grumpy old man about kids these days not knowing how to program their assembly language and, uh, and all this. I, but I do sometimes think that there, there is value to be had for going back and looking at resource constrained situations. Because again, just you know, right now, resource constraints matter. We sweat a lot on Rage about getting our systems to, to fit into these constraints, even though 
they're insane compared to what you would have in the early days. You know, you look at, you know, you, your cell phone is far more powerful than a Cray supercomputer, and we're using it for, for all of these silly mundane things with all of these layers of inefficiency, but it still winds up being the right thing to do. But we have not yet reached the point where we don't care about resource constraints. So sometimes I do think that there would be value in spending time on much more tightly constrained platforms. And I thought for a little while cell phones were, were like that, where we look at this and say, okay, 128K for Doom RPG. Let's cram it all in there and you learn you know, all this silly stuff about optimizing Java byte code and different things like that. But that has, you know, it's rocketed so far ahead. It's like, this is just, and the crazy thing is, this is all in the space that we've been developing Rage, that I started doing some of the little work on feature phones, and we get the iPhone out and Android and going through all of this, and then we're up to these gigahertz processors with gigabyte of RAM that you can carry around in your pocket, and, oh, optimizing for 128K doesn't seem all that relevant anymore. But I still think back to that it might even be worth having an artificial limitation, you know, where there are... Uh, I think pretty highly of a lot of the, the people that do 64K demo competitions and things like that, where it's an arbitrary guideline, but to go ahead and, and fit something in there, there are things that you learn doing that. And sometimes I think that maybe there should be something like that where you pick some older platform that's, uh, you know, that's low performance, but uh, low enough performance that you evaluate some of these interesting questions. Uh, but you could still program it and explore different ways of doing things. And I've actually spent a reasonable amount of time thinking through this where I think the right thing to do would be to take one of the old consoles uh, that they were produced in the millions and you take something on the level of a PS1 or a, uh, you know, a Nintendo, an Ultra 64 or something where it's a 32-bit system, you can write real programs in it, it's not dealing with bizarro, quirky hardware, but just something where you go back and revisit things. Like, well, how would you write you know, a web browser in this space or a mail program. And I'm thinking this would be kind of like the Society for Creative Anachronism for Programmers. Instead of bash bashing each other with foam swords, you're playing on archaic hardware and, you know, and maybe having some educational, uh, you know, upside to it. Uh, and that's on my list of things that I will probably never get to do for time constraints. I, but, you know, I, I'd like to go back and, and spend some time playing with the older things where, Getting a sense of that, I do think, is valuable. It's hard to quantify the value for, for that, but like, I'd love to, if we had a hole in our schedule, to say, okay, programming team, uh, we're all going to write an Atari 2600 game. You, know, you have X number of days. Let's, uh, let's see what everybody does. It'll be an interesting experience. Uh, and that does tie a little bit into another one of the issues with how the company's grown on this, and one of the things that we're not doing a spectacular job on is I... You know, it is has really been sink or swim where somebody gets hired, they're like, okay, here's your desk, here's your, you know, here's how you bring down the source code and uh, make yourself productive real quick now. Uh, which is, you know, and some people have thrived under that. You know, we've got some of the people that just have dived in and figured everything out and, uh, you know, written all of their little test cases and stuff and, uh, and explored and learned, but it's not the most efficient way to deal with this. And we're still grappling with how we, you know, how we deal with this, not just in programming, but across the whole thing, and perhaps even more so in, in content development, because people come in, I, you know, that have worked on Unreal Engine or something like that, and they know how to make things happen there, and then they have no idea whatsoever uh, how to make something happen with our current generation of technology. And certainly we don't have a polished SDK and commercial books available. Uh, it is a shame that we don't have the... Uh, you know, the mod community that we used to draw so heavily from. And there are just large trends in the industry that we're going to release our editor for Rage, uh, but it's kind of going to be a non-issue. You can go in and change layers and make new layouts for monsters, but I uh, you know there will not be many people that are trying to make a new mega texture. It's just too involved. There's too much effort. Uh, it's just so much work, and there's so many things you have to know. And it does sadden me that, that, that we don't have that anymore, and that means we don't have the pool of people to, to draw on. I, I guess that's a perfect place to segue into the, I, uh, the Doom 3 source code will be released this year. I got permission from, I am, it's a, so it's actually, 
I really want to say how cool ZeniMax has been about this, where you know we, we tested the waters a little bit with the, the open source uh, Doom Classic on iOS and, the, um, uh, and then releasing the enemy territory Wolfenstein source on that. But uh, the problem, the issue with the Doom source space is there's actually still a project in development that's derived off of this. Prey 2 is heavily modified, but it's still essentially an id tech 4 project on this. And Brink was also heavily modified, but id tech 4 on this. So obviously we're not gonna put any effort into this until Rage is out the door on the street. Uh, programmers are not going to be pulled off of even testing or triage or anything to, to do this, but uh, the okay has been given and it will be happening. We have to make sure we get all of our uh, I's dotted and T's crossed uh, on the legal department, but it's, as another interesting point on here, I had a, I had, uh, a lady from the legal department uh, last year's Christmas party at ZeniMax just come up and tell me how important she thought it was that we were doing the open source of the code base. And that was you know, a little bit of a double take. It's like, look, legal department, lawyers, I, you think this is good? Great. <laughs> uh, so ZeniMax has been really, really supportive of this. And I... You know, I almost put this out as a challenge to some of the other software companies. I, you know, there's a lot of you that could be releasing seminal, classic, old source code that the community would appreciate, that young programmers can learn from, that all these other benefits can come out of. It's clearly been good for us. I, in the early years, there was argument about it, about whether you know we gave away too much or we helped competitors on this, but. Uh, there's no doubt at this point that the legacy of, of the open source software has been a really good thing for id, and I, I'm really happy that we're able to kind of continue that going forward. So uh, the, uh, the perfect opportunity to pick something up from the Steam sale, if you don't have Doom 3 data handy, uh, that's the place to get it now, which is also a great thing where in previous generations when we'd release source code, if you didn't have it on your shelf, trying to find some rummage bin with an old version of the, the software was challenging, but now you just go to Steam and, uh, and get the stuff that way and you can get it and start playing around with it. All right, thank you all.